Lenovo's Lock was my favourite budget gaming laptop last year. But is that still the case with the new 2024 redesign? I've got a cheaper model with Arc graphics and a slightly more expensive model with Nvidia GeForce graphics to find out. Now Lenovo has made some nice changes this year, but as you'll see in this review, not everything is better. But first, this part of the video is sponsored by the Ugreen Nexo Pro 100W charger. With up to 100 watts from a single port, it can charge a MacBook Pro 14 from 0 to 86% in just 60 minutes, while also being smaller than my 96 watt MacBook charger too. And with a Type-A and two Type-C ports, it can also charge up to three devices at once, even your laptop, with all the latest fast charge protocols. Or if you need even more power, you can charge up to four devices with the Ugreen Nexo Pro 160 watt charger. Check them out and Ugreen's whole range of chargers with the link below. The lock still has a great plus plastic finish on the lid and interior, just like last year. Build quality still feels decent, there's not much flex to the keyboard or lid even when pushing down fairly hard but there is a little more screen wobble noticeable. The front of the lid sticks out a little, making one finger opening easy. And now this year, the lid goes all the way back. The hinges still feel solid, even when ripping the lid open fast. And despite the extra wobble noted, the lock is slightly thinner this year with a typical size for a mid-range gaming laptop. It's not small, but still portable. The laptop alone weighs 5.3 pounds or 2.4 kilos, similar to last year, increasing to 6.6 .6 pounds or 3 kilos with the relatively small 170 watt charger included. Both of my lock laptops have the same screen, battery, SSD, and RAM. The only difference is the CPU and GPU. The cheaper configuration has an older 12th gen CPU and Intel Arc graphics, while the slightly more expensive one has a newer 13th gen Gen CPU and NVIDIA graphics. There's also a 14th gen CPU option with RTX 4050 or 4060 graphics, so there's a fair bit of customization available. You can check the options and current prices with the link below. The keyboard has four zones of RGB backlighting, but there's also a cheaper white only option. All keys and secondary functions get lit up, and you can change between three profiles with the function and spacebar shortcut. There aren't any keyboard shortcuts for controlling key brightness, but Spectrum in Lenovo's Vantage control panel gives you two brightness levels. And this is where you customize the RGB lighting effects. I thought the keyboard felt nice to type with, as I usually like Lenovo keyboards. My partner isn't usually a fan, but she thought it was fine. The touchpad works alright, but we both thought that it didn't feel very smooth. It's plastic, and sometimes it just felt like it was gripping my fingers and making it harder for me to move. As for ports, the right side has a USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C port, camera disconnect switch, 3.5mm audio combo jack, and a USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A port. They've also completely removed the air exhaust vents on the left and right sides this year. More on that soon. There's nothing at all on the left side. Last year's model had the audio and Type-C here but now it's all on the right. I thought this was a strange choice, given most mouse users are right-handed. Why not move it all to the left instead of the right? The rest is on the back. We've got two more USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A ports, a HDMI 2.1 output, gigabit ethernet, and the power input on the right. The same ports as last year's model, just in a different order. The Type-C port on the right can be used to charge on both laptops, and it also provides display port support, so you can connect screens. I also confirmed both the Type-C port and HDMI ports always connect directly to the discrete graphics, bypassing the integrated graphics whether Optimus is on or off, and that's the case on both laptops. Getting inside was much easier compared to last year's lock. Just take out the 10 Phillips head screws and pry it open. I'll leave a link to the pry tools I use below the video. The internal layout is the same in both laptops, with the battery down the front, two DDR5 memory slots in the middle, M.2 SSD on the right with a spare slot on the left, and Wi-Fi 6 card just under the spare slot. Wi-Fi speed wasn't amazing, and basically the same compared to last year's lock with the same Wi-Fi card. But it almost gigabit speed, it should be fine for most people. Both of my locks came with 512 gig SSDs, but they're different models. The one in the more expensive 13th gen plus Nvidia combo was faster. And both M.2 slots fit my 4TB drive with chips on both sides no problem, which wasn't the case last year. 
the upgradability score was about as good as it can get compared to most other laptops. The 2024 lock is a point ahead compared to last year because those were harder to open up and get inside, and one of their M.2 slots didn't support double-sided SSDs. The speakers are found down the front on the left and right sides. I thought they sounded average for a gaming laptop. Nothing special and not much bass, but they're clear enough and loud enough. The latency mon results weren't good on both laptops, but that's been the case with most laptops in the last 12 months. Both of my locks are powered by a 4-cell 60Wh battery, but there's also a larger 80Wh option, which is why mine has some empty space. The Vantage software also lets you enable adaptive refresh rate, which lowers the screen's refresh rate down to 60Hz when you unplug the charger to save power. The screen flashes black as the refresh rate changes, and it automatically goes back up when you plug back in. You can manually do this at any time with the Function Plus R shortcut. You can also enable conservation mode in Vantage. This limits the maximum charge level between 75 and 80%, helping battery longevity. You can't use it at the same time as rapid charge. And you've also got the option to charge the battery slower overnight, again to help longevity. Battery life wasn't amazing, with both laptops lasting just over 4 hours in video play back. And about the same result makes sense, as they're both using the same integrated graphics. The game test, however, indicates that Nvidia is more power efficient, as it was lasting for 51% longer with a game running. Last year's Lock 15 with the same sized battery was able to last longer, because the 13700H uses the newer Intel Iris Xe integrated graphics, while the 13450HX is using Intel UHD graphics. Based on my testing last year, it's absolutely worth paying a little more for the 80 watt hour upgrade if available in your region. Unfortunately, I noticed some battery drain during my thermal testing. During that, I run a combined CPU and GPU stress test to simulate a full load worst case scenario. And by the time that was finished, the Arc laptop had 93% battery charge remaining, while the Nvidia laptop had 85% left. So it's nothing too major considering I was running those thermal tests for more than 3 hours. But it's not ideal, because this just doesn't happen on most other laptops I test. You can enable the battery drop protection option in Lenovo's BIOS, which limits power and performance to prevent battery dropping, which sounds like a great solution. But on the Nvidia laptop, I found that this meant that the RTX 3050 was limited to just 30 watts of power, down from 90, so it just doesn't perform anywhere near as good when running games. So it's not really a great solution unless you don't need the extra power. That said, you could probably use custom mode to manually lower the GPU power to something in between. Basically, we're limited by the 170 watt charger, and last year's 3050 lock had the same charger too. So this may not be new this year. I didn't see a battery drain issue with my locks last year, but those came with a heavier 230 watt charger, as they had more powerful CPUs and GPUs. Again, this was only noticeable during extended periods with both the CPU and GPU fully utilised. Most games just aren't going to behave that way for an extended period like a stress test. And considering in that worst case I only lost 10-15% to after 3 hours, I don't think it's going to be a big issue for most people. Let's get into those thermals next. Both laptops have two fans with a heat pipe shed between the CPU and GPU. There are air intake vents directly above the fans, as well as exhaust at the back. As mentioned earlier, this year's lock removes the air exhaust vents on the left and right sides, so no hot air blowing on your mouse hand. Air only comes out the back in this year's model. But does this mean the laptop gets hotter? Lenovo says no, as they're using foam inserts to better control airflow inside, which apparently makes up the difference. Lenovo's Vantage software allows us to change between different performance modes, which from lowest to highest are quiet, balance, performance, and custom. Custom mode lets us set the fans to full speed or customize them, and we've also got the option to tweak CPU and GPU power and temperature limits, at least on the Nvidia version. The Arc laptop 
desktop only has CPU control. You can't do anything to the Arc graphics in here. The Arc laptop also doesn't have this GPU overclock option available at all. Meanwhile the Nvidia version does, and automatically enables it in custom mode, but only with the new Extreme option enabled. This is a new option this year, which we'll test too. You can also hold the function key and press the letter Q to cycle between all modes except custom. But this year they've also added a checkbox to give you the option to include custom in the rotation. The power button changes colour to reflect the performance mode, so you can quickly see what mode you're on at any time. And I think it looks better compared to last year's version, which was just a little light up dot. Let's start out with the 13th gen and Nvidia laptop. The internal temps were cool at idle, but even with the stress test running in the higher modes, it's nowhere near what I'd consider to be hot. Custom mode was actually a bit warmer with a cooling pad. The one I test with is linked below the video, and setting the fans to full speed was also warmer. We can see why when looking at the clock speeds. The CPU performance is significantly higher, about 1 GHz higher on the 6P cores. Interestingly, balance mode also had better CPU performance than the higher performance mode, but we can see why when looking at the power levels. Balance mode limits the RTX 3050 to 75 watts, but at the expense of better CPU performance. Then the GPU is able to max out in performance mode, but CPU power gets limited to 30 watts. The Nvidia control panel says this is a 95 watt 3050 with dynamic boost, so sustaining above 90 watts with the CPU loaded up at the same time confirms that this is a full powered 3050. We can see why custom mode with the cooling pad or fans maxed out was warmer. The CPU gets boosted to 50 watts. I don't have a problem with this, as the temps were still relatively cool, so might as well make the most of it and boost performance. Alright, now for the 12th gen and Arc laptop. GPU temps were slightly warmer compared to the Nvidia one, but CPU temps were lower. And I mean, realistically, if we're under 80 degrees Celsius, it's ice cold as far as gaming laptop internals are concerned. The CPU clock speeds are much higher with the 12th gen laptop, and that's because it has two fewer P cores to power. GPU clocks of the Arc A530M are similar to the RTX 3050, but these likely aren't directly comparable. The 12th gen CPU was still maxing out at around 50 watts in custom mode, but the Arc graphics don't seem to go above 62 watts. This is the first time I've had an Arc laptop, but I don't think it's a full powered GPU. If I stop the CPU part of the stress test, performance mode in a GPU only test increases 10 watts to 72 watts. Intel's website notes that this is a 65 to 95 watt part, leading me to conclude that the Arc Lock doesn't have a full powered GPU like the more expensive Nvidia version. Here's how the different performance modes affect game performance. I've got the cheaper Arc laptop in purple and more expensive Nvidia laptop in red. For some reason, custom mode performed really bad on the Arc laptop in this game. In most cases, even the 1% lows from the 3050 were higher than the averages coming from Arc, meaning the Nvidia laptop is more stable and consistent. We test from lowest mode to highest so maybe it took a while for Arc's 4 gigs of VRAM to run out. The CPU can use more power when the GPU is idle, like in Cinebench. We're looking at a 41% higher multi-core score in this workload on the more expensive 13th gen configuration thanks to the 50% extra P cores, while single core was 8% faster. I've never had either of these CPUs before for testing, but the 12450HX doesn't look that great when Lenovo's Legion 5 from 4 years ago comes out on top in multi-core performance. To be fair, that was more expensive when it was new, and the single core score isn't as good. The Lux 12450HX has the same core and thread count as the non-X version just below in MSI's cheaper GF63, but that chassis doesn't have as good cooling, so the power limit can't boost as high as the lock. The 13450HX on the other hand was fairly close to the 13700H that I tested in last year's lock. Those ones just have four extra e -core giving them a little extra multi-core performance. And hey, it's able to beat my MacBook Pro 14, which costs more than five times more. Performance lowers if we unplug the charger and instead run purely off of battery power, and we're limited to balance mode without the charger. The 12450HX hardly changed, while the 13450HX dropped back, putting
putting them fairly close together. I'm not sure why the single core score on the 12th gen laptop actually increased 2% on battery power, but that was consistent over a number of tests. Unlike last year's 13700H lock laptops, we've got HX processors this year, and the X means the chip is unlocked. You can use this by enabling Legion optimization in the BIOS. Then this enables the CPU overclock option in Vantage. I haven't bothered testing overclocking, as the default max clock speeds weren't a limit, but you can also undervolt through here too. Most laptops I test are in the low 30 degrees Celsius range on the keyboard at idle, and both of my locks were below this and cool. The Intel Arc version was notably warmer with the stress test running in the lowest quiet mode, but I wouldn't classify it as hot. It's a similar deal in the higher balance mode too, but again, neither are hot to the touch. Performance mode was a little warmer on the Arc version too. The Arc laptop is using more CPU power, but less GPU power. There's not much of a difference with both laptops running in custom mode, with all available power sliders set to maximum. Setting the fans to maximum is a little cooler, more so for the Arc model, but it gets louder too. Let's have a listen. The fans were audible on both when just sitting there doing nothing at idle. The fan noise was the same on both regardless of ARC or GeForce graphics. And I also found performance mode was about 2 decibels quieter compared to last year's lock, while setting the fans to max speed was 4 decibels quieter. I think that's a good result. Not only does the lock run a bit quieter this year, but the internal temps are still excellent despite the removal of the left and right air exhaust fans. At least with this lower powered hardware. It might be a bit of a different story with i7 processors or RTX 4050 or 4060 GPUs. Now, both of these locks have 15.6 inch 1080p 144Hz screens, but the higher tier 1440p 165Hz screens that I covered in last year's lock review are still available with this year's lock for extra money. So if you're considering the more expensive 1440p screen, then you can check out my 2023 lock review which will have all of the details on it. There were some slight differences in colour gamut, despite both laptops having the exact same panel, so it just goes to show you that the panel lottery is real and each screen is a little different. In any case, colours are decent for what's meant to be a budget friendly option. I've definitely seen far worse. The panel with the brighter colour gamut was also slightly brighter too, but not much. And again, it's random luck. It's a 300 nit panel, which is the minimum I want to see. This puts it in line with other cheaper gaming laptops from last year that it's competing with, like Aces Nitro 5, Asus's Tough A16, or Gigabyte's G5. There was a little backlight bleed from the top corners on both laptops, but it wasn't bright enough to ever notice it during normal use. There's an overdrive option in the Vantage software, but I'm guessing it's meant to be for the higher tier 1440p 165Hz screen, because turning it on and off didn't make a difference. I measured an average greater gray response time of 14 milliseconds, which Lenovo says is in spec for this 1080p 144Hz panel. It's not an amazing result when you consider that a 144Hz screen needs half that response time at just under 7 milliseconds for all transitions to occur within the refresh window. But at the same time, it's also faster when compared to other similarly priced laptops I've tested with 144Hz screens. That said, the similarly priced Tough A16 was a fair bit faster. The total system latency is the amount of time between a mouse click and when a gunshot fire appears on the screen in CSGO. The more expensive config with newer 13th gen CPU and Nvidia graphics was faster, but both had a higher standard deviation compared to most other laptops tested, which just means less consistent results. More shots were higher or lower than the reported average. I've actually started sharing the results on my Jared's.tech 
website. You can click on a result to see more details. I'll leave a link to this page below the video. Both laptops have a MUX switch, so you can disable Optimus by setting DGPU mode in Vantage, but that needs a reboot to apply. You can avoid rebooting with the Nvidia laptop because it has advanced Optimus, so you can instead change through the Nvidia control panel. Unfortunately, Intel doesn't currently have an equivalent to this, so rebooting is the only way to change with the Arc version. The Nvidia version has G-Sync, but the Intel one has a variable refresh rate option too. Mine has a 1080p camera above the screen, but there's a 720p option in some regions. There's no Windows Hello Face Unlock, but it has a privacy shutter with a switch on the right. Here's how the camera and microphones look and sound, and this is what it sounds like while typing on the keyboard. Now let's find out how well both locks perform in games. We've tested both the Intel Arc A530M with 4 gigs of VRAM and the Nvidia RTX 3050 with 6 gigs of VRAM. And don't forget, the Nvidia version is also paired with a slightly newer CPU too. Cyberpunk 2077 was tested the same on all laptops, and I've got both configurations of Lock 15 shown by the red highlights. The Nvidia configuration was reaching a 55% higher average frame rate compared to the Arc configuration. Not bad at all, considering its MSRP is just 7% higher. The dips in performance were quite bad in this test on the Arc laptop, as per the 1% lows, which were a third of the Nvidia laptop, which I suspect is due to the 4 gigs of VRAM struggling in modern games. Red Dead Redemption 2 was tested with the game's benchmark, and the Nvidia config was 40% higher in average FPS compared to Arc this time. Again, definitely seems worth it for 7% extra money. That said, the Nvidia lock still couldn't match an RTX 2060 from 4 years ago. And even MSI's GF63 with RTX 4050 was ahead while also being more than $200 cheaper than the lock. Though, that said, the GF63 is a worse laptop in every other possible way. The Nvidia version was 44% faster than Arc in control, and the Arc laptop didn't have the same dips in performance that we saw in Cyberpunk. In fact, the 1% lows with Arc were slightly ahead of the Nvidia lock. Intel's Arc graphics drivers get frequent performance improvements though, so results may have more variance depending on the specific game. The 3050 lock was also much closer to that 4050 now, but the GF63 has a low GPU power limit. The lock is also available with Intel's 14th gen processors and RTX 4050 and 4060 graphics, so with that more expensive configuration, I'd expect it to be similar to other higher powered results. Here are the 3D Mark results for those that find them useful. Lenovo's BIOS has a lot of extra options that many other laptops like Asus, Razer, and Acer simply don't have. It's only really beaten by Dell slash Alienware and MSI's Advanced BIOS, which has an insane amount of customization available. Linux support was tested with an Ubuntu 23.10 Live CD. By default, the keyboard, touchpad, camera, speakers, Ethernet, and Wi Fi all work fine. All keyboard shortcuts for adjusting screen brightness, changing keyboard lighting profile, volume control, and performance modes worked too. An excellent result. Pricing and availability will change over time, so check the link below the video for updates and current sales. And if these are anything like last year's lock, I would expect some really good sales. So make sure you check out our GamingLaptop.Deals website with the link below. We update that every day to include all of the latest sales, so check it out regularly to save money on your next gaming laptop. Now, I'm making this video before these laptops officially launch, so I can't check websites for prices just yet. But Lenovo have told me that the Arc configuration will start from $749 US dollars, while the Nvidia configuration will start from $799, so $50 extra for the Nvidia laptop. But I would definitely expect them to get cheaper with sales, considering that last year's lock with faster RTX 4050 graphics went on sale for just $600. And if they don't, then just look out for the older 2023 versions and see if they're better value. Because at the end of the day, there aren't really a whole lot of major differences between them. Overall, Lenovo's Lock 15 is still a great budget-friendly gaming laptop compared to what alternatives offer at this price point, like the Nvidia config having both G-Sync and Advanced Optimus. But I mean, this is the first laptop review I'm doing in 2024, so it's completely possible that the competition will catch up. We'll have to wait and see. Make sure you're subscribed for my future laptop reviews to find out. The visual design changes are only small, but are 
welcome improvements. I think the black keyboard is a bit easier to see, the new power button design is brighter, and not having hot air blowing on your mouse hand is always welcome, especially when the thermals were otherwise fine. The extra upgradability by now supporting two double-sided SSDs is nice too, but the changes aren't all good. Why have the left side blank and move its ports to the right, when you could have instead had the right side blank and move the ports to the left for the majority of right-handed mouse users? The battery drain due to the smaller 170 watt charger isn't ideal, but it's possible that that may not be a new issue. But the biggest problem to me was the Arc laptop. It's got worse performance in games, worse battery life while running a game, less VRAM on the GPU, no advanced Optimus so you have to reboot, and Intel's driver support is still playing catch up compared to Nvidia. Look, it's not terrible for a basic entry level gaming experience, but you'd be crazy not to spend $50 more to get the Nvidia version, making the cheaper Arc version just feel a bit pointless. But there are plenty of other new gaming laptops coming out this year, so check out this video next to see what's coming in 2024. I was recently at CES and got to see what all the brands have coming. Well, technically I haven't actually left for CES yet, I'm making this video before I go, but I'm scheduling it after that video. Anyway, I'll see you in that one next.